Uh, namaste, my name is Gaurav Brastogi. My spiritual name is Ekras Gorak. Um, I run an AI company. Uh, we, we build AI artificial intelligence software to automate uh, things uh, for people to do. I also run a foundation where I teach yoga and meditation uh, to people. And my project there has been to figure out ways we can all live deeply using the technology, techniques, and wisdom already available to us through our traditions. And so I call it the yoga of living deeply. And uh, I, I spend a lot of time on that. I have a meditation podcast. And uh, we, I run sittings at home as well. I have a website where I post a lot of content as well. And I do these interfaith talks. Yesterday I was at um, an interfaith talk talking about what happens after death. So I had to come back from the dead to tell that story. And I'm getting it. Um, so this is, we have about a little over an hour together, so I'd like to make this interactive. There's a lot of to topics I could cover for you. We will experience meditation for a few minutes, so I'll talk about why it's important. And I'll give you a flavor for how Hinduism's roots are in uh, meditation. Um, both ways, but Hinduism's roots are in meditation. And a lot of what you know as Hindu culture today comes from people who um, who just sat there and did nothing other than introspect and see inside them. And a lot of the cosmology and our view of the world itself is informed by people who uh, <clears throat> sat deeply into meditation and came back with uh, things that helped them and can help all of us as well. So I'm going to begin with a traditional prayer and then we'll go uh, and then we'll have a class. So if you don't mind, just sit, sit straight, just sit comfortably, any pose is fine. I'll be chanting Om three times and then I'll be chanting a prayer. This prayer is not to any specific God, it's to divinity in general. It's, uh, so it's not addressed to any form of God, uh, but it is addressed as a relationship prayer. Um, and it's typically said in a class, at the beginning of a yoga class, for example. And what it says is, uh, May we both be protected, may we both be nourished, may our actions be radiant, and uh, may there be no disputes or differences between us. So it's sort of like a legal disclaimer, but in Sanskrit. So, so I'll be saying Om three times, then I'll chant the Sanskrit words, and then I'll say Shanti, peace, three times, and I can explain what that means later. So just sit comfortably, close your eyes. As you sit comfortably with your eyes closed, bring your attention inside to your breath. As you exhale, settle a little bit more into your posture. Just ease into this class, this sitting, this session. If you like, you can bring your palms together at the heart center. This is the normal prayer mode. So pressing the palms together gently, pressing the fingers together gently, and gently touching the back of the thumbs to the chest. We want the vibrations in the heart to follow through into the palm, and the hollow of the palm acts as a resonating chamber. So you might feel some energy there. <clears throat> I'll chant on three times and then the prayer. Exhale completely, take a deep breath. Inhale. Oh. Inhale. Shanti, 
palms down into your lap. And blinking, open your eyes. The traditional greeting for Hindus is Namaskar. Namaskar means, uh, Nama means to bow, and Kar is to, 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 is to act, so it's to bow. Namaste, which is what you would say in a yoga class, Te means you. It's the same as Tu in uh, other languages. Sports. And so I, I, I bow to you, that's the traditional opening greeting. And the bowing is as much to the other individual as it is to recognize the divinity within each of us. Uh, so our conception of the divine as God or our creator is not only outside but also inside and acting through us. And um, so we say God lives in our heart and each other's heart as well, as well as our form and everything else. So, uh, so namaste and welcome to the class. Now before we begin, do you have questions or things that you want to know from, from me? You can ask, talk to each other and, and figure out uh, do you want to tell, tell your neighbor yeah, talk, what yeah. questions you, you have? You can talk to a partner and figure out what you want from today and then we'll come back out. Okay, go. Do you want me to stop? Give me a minute. Ten minutes prior. Just tell me. Ten minutes prior. So I'm going to stop you 15 minutes before the end because there's always announcements at the end. Yeah. So I'm going to stop you at 2 to 15. Okay. What is your name? Yeah, what is your name? It's uh, yeah. 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 So I'm going to do a rest of because there's no slots in here. Sure, yeah. It's supposed to be God's time. Yeah. 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 Alright, time's up. Mm -hmm. Alright, who wants to go first? Yes, sir. Um, do you follow all aspects of like, the Hinduism religion, or do you kind of like follow some, some of it in some of the traditions and rituals? Alright, what else? Yes, sir. How do you follow like science and like coding and math, but still believe in religion? Great question. Yes, ma'am. You had a question? Someone there had a hand up. Yes. Um, I, I know that like um like Hinduism is very popular about other religions, but like in terms of like um a person going to moksha, like how do you like view other like followers of like other religion in your daily lives? Sure. Okay. With so you're saying way to moksha with respect to followers of any other religion? Yeah, because like I know like there's like well I mean not really Muslim, but like like it's uh, a lot of like still like the ideas like how do you like uh adhere to like the views of other followers? Sure. Okay. Uh yeah, I'm thinking similar to hers in that I know that a big pillar of the Hindu belief is that um, God can take other forms and can have different forms of God. So uh, I guess similar question would be: Do Hindus generally interpret that as accepting all religions to be true and just a different form of claiming to be God, or do they see it as one is being more valid than another? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. What is the caste system like today? All right. You got everything. Those are great questions. I, and I'll just be sure to remind me to answer these questions before we go. All right. But I got the answer to the question, so that's, that's helpful to know. All right. <clears throat> so I'll give you a little bit, a bit of background so you know who I am and, and, um, and so on. Uh, I was born into a religious family. My father was very devout, and um, he would pray every day. And in his, uh, in his altar, he would have, uh, we would have images of gods like you have in the classroom below and not too dissimilar uh, from the class in the sense that um, all religions were, were uh, you know, were, show, were showing on the altar. And that's uh, typical. Adding gods is less of a problem in, in Hinduism. You can add a new god anytime. And so you'll see a lot of new temples have a Muslim peer, uh, his statue, as, as, as a prominent part of it, and that's his, his murti, and that's just that's com completely okay. Um, so that's the family I was born into. Uh, I spent a lot of my early youth reading Western philosophy, and then for the last two decades that I've been in the U.S., I've uh, trained under 14 different teachers, uh, 
uh, in yoga meditation and different schools of philosophy and so on. My own schooling was in a Christian school, uh, Protestant, not Catholic, and uh, and so I read the Old Testament and the New Testament, and um, and I'm somewhat well versed with Buddhism uh, and Buddhism and Taoism as well. Um, Sufi Islam has a strong influence in India, so most people are familiar with or are uh, sort of somehow connected to Sufi Islam. They understand what the basic tenets are. So that's my background. Um, I, uh, I have two kids. One's in college. He's at UC Berkeley. And my daughter, uh, my son's in college. My daughter is in high school in Dublin, which is the Irish city just by on the East Bay. So, uh, so that's my background. Uh, my own traditional, uh, so my own uh, practice is uh, is of course deeply Hindu. I've read the Hindu scriptures uh, at length and uh, studied them and tried to draw connections between the scripture and, and my daily life. And so some of those questions will come in, including your question on on technology and science and, and Hinduism. Uh, I will try to cover them and, uh, and, uh, and address those. <clears throat> in today's talk, uh, I wanted to give you a flavor of uh, the Yoga of Living Deeply, which is the project that I'm very interested in. Um, from a Hindu class perspective, a lot of the, all the principles I use are, are available as raw material in the Hindu tradition. Uh, Hinduism itself is not a religion of one book. Uh, it's not as much a religion in the sort of English sense. It's a dharma. And dharma is a sort of a broader definition than in religion itself is. So Hindus, uh, our own name for our tradition is Sanatana Dharma. Sanatan means eternal and timeless. And Dharma means uh, that which holds together. So those two words are sort of like a T-shape, not, not too dissimilar from the cross shape you have behind me. It's T-shaped in the sense that something that is eternal and timeless does not live in time. Right? Something that's true on Monday but untrue on Friday is not true. Would you agree? Because then it's in time and it's only temporarily true. And so anything, there's a deep search for what's eternal in the Indian tradition, in the Hindu tradition. So what is true and what's always true irrespective of space, time and context, that's the Sanatana part. But the counter to that is the Dharma. What is it that holds things together with the ever-changing space, time and context? That's Dharma. Dharma literally means that which holds together. And it's like glue. So if, you see, if you've seen a stone arch, you've seen a stone arch. They're all stones, but they've now been assembled into an arch. Why are they hung together? Right? It's because of the keystone in the middle. Yeah, the keystone in the middle is holding it together. But the arch itself is standing on its own free weight. right? So the mutual interdependence of the parts, including the keystone which holds everything together, is holding it together. No other external force is needed. Right? Why do birds migrate thousands of miles? Why, why do you have a body clock? There are things that are inside us that are natural to us. Right? But these natural truths change from moment to moment. It's in the context where the truth is evident. Right? And that's the ever-changing. So if you juxtapose those two words together, you're looking at something that never changes and something that is always changing, but it's there, it's not chaos. There's always order to the universe. Things are not just breaking apart. Gravity is not here today and gone tomorrow. Magnetic compass is not always you know, changing around, right? Stuff is somewhat stable, and that stability is, is, is created by some sense of order. And that's the dharma part of Hindu dharma, so Sanatana dharma. So that's the tradition. And so deep in the tradition is a search for both the eternal and the changing. And, and that's, that's what I'll talk about. Um, so when I say living deeply, uh, there are parts of it, and I'll try to sort of dive into some parts uh, for your advantage. Now I'm going to talk about three things, and I'll, I'll take a popular vote. So stay awake um, through this. Number one, I'm going to talk about our relationship with work. I'm going to talk about our relationship with ourselves, our individuality, and I'm going to talk about our relationship with the divine. 
which is more interesting for you to begin with? Yourself. Yourself? All right. So, <clears throat> so there are three different margas, as you would have read in the Hindu school. One is the karma marga, karma yoga we call it, which is the way of action. This is jnana yoga, which is jnana marga, which is the way of knowledge. And the third is bhakti, which is the way of devotion. And we're talking now about the jnana marga. All of yoga, uh, ashtanga yoga, the yoga classes that you might go to, relates to this part, which is our relationship with ourselves. And underlying this is an eight step process to self-realization. Uh, the eight step process is laid out by a sage called Patanjali. And if you, if you have you heard the word, uh, you heard of yoga of course. Have you heard of the word Ashtanga? There are some yoga studios which are Ashtanga yoga studios. But you hear it if you ever go to a yoga class, it's, it's pretty popular. Um, eight step, eight limb, it's called. And in that system it begins with basic discipline, yam niyam which is uh, things like don't steal, don't, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't be unclean, don't waste your energy, always say the truth, basic discipline. Yam and Niyam is personal and interpersonal discipline, I'll skip through that. The next thing is Asana, which is posture practice. Uh, when you go to a yoga class, of the eight steps, you're only getting the third step, which is Asana. Uh, which is asana, A-S-A-N-A, is how you type it in English. Uh, and that's simply about posture maintenance, sitting upright and being able to hold the posture. Then we come to pranayama, which is the regulation of breath. The regulation of breath allows us to begin to engage with our subconscious. So far we're dealing with the physical body. But then you want to be able to talk to your inner body even in, in our physical body. If I ask you right this moment to stop your digestion, can you do that? All right, how about mm, stop your heart rate, heartbeat for like a second? Can't do it? All right, how about stop sweating? Can't do it? Mm. How about, um, could you grow this little pinky nail for me? Someone? Can't do it? Your body is doing most of the running on its own, thank you very much. Your conscious experience does not really talk much to your inner experience. You understand, right? That the conscious experience is really a very thin veneer on top of a completely hidden internal, uh, internal action. Your stomach is digesting without you thinking that, hey, now I'm digesting, right? Your blood is circulating without you thinking, I must circulate my blood now, it's been a while. These things are happening on their own, you understand that, right? So how do you interface with, with the inner workings of your body? And through regulation of breath, you can actually talk to your inner, inner self. And so in step four of the eight step path, you're beginning to talk to the insides. And by beginning to talk to your insides, you're beginning to now take some control over your inner experience. Have you been in a situation where you're super sleepy and you need to keep awake? Have you been in a situation where you're um, you're too excited, you're like you're, your hands are trembling and now you want to calm down? Jittering even? Have you been in situations where um, you're panicking for no obvious reason and now you gotta just calm yourself down? You're stressed out. Now, those are the body's responses to something that's going on, but you have no access to them. Right? You just told me you can't control your sweating, your heart rate, your digestion, your reproductive organs, none of this stuff you can control. So how do you talk to your body? How do you engage your inner self? Because it turns out your inner self is still talking to your mind, whether you're talking to it or not. What I mean by that is, you have moods. Is there anyone who's not experienced moods? Please just raise your hand. You have moods. Your moods determine your thoughts, your emotional state. So how do you talk to your moods and say, look, this is the mood I want. I want to be happy, or I don't want to be sad right now, or I want to be excited, what have you. Your moods talk to you. You don't talk to your moods. So through breath regulation, you're beginning to engage the inner body. 
That's step four. Step five now begins at sense withdrawal. If you've seen a turtle that that's moving around in its shell, it's walking around like this, and then decides to put its limbs into the shell. Right? That's what we're doing. Withdrawal of the sense organs from the world outside. Five senses pulling them back in. That's step five, which is pratyahar. Step six <coughs> is dharana. Dharana means to now rest your attention on something outside or inside, but letting it rest on something. Step seven is dhyana, which is if you're going to the Zen monastery, you're actually going to a dhyan center. Dhyana is awareness itself. Mindfulness, you might call it in English, or insight, and so on. And final step of this, I'm getting to your question, is Samadhi. Samadhi is a, is a, is, it's a separate state of existence, sort of. Uh, you're waking, sleeping, dreaming, and there's a fourth state. And Samadhi is a stepwise process to reaching that state of, of uh, consciousness. Now, what does that have to do with uh, getting to know yourself? It turns out, most people will live their lives out without getting to know the first thing about themselves. Because pretty much everything we know about ourselves, we were told by others. And we constantly rely on mediated experience, a reflective mirror that tells, you, tells us who we are. Whether we're good looking, whether we're rich or powerful or, or you know, influential, all of those things are things other people tell us. Other people tell us what our name is. Right? We don't take the time to look, to turn the, the, the attention around and look at ourselves. So if you look at an outbound tendency, which is the normal mode of experience, this is the opposite of that. Uh, metanoia in that sense, it's a turning in of the, the senses. And through that turning in, what you're trying to do is getting to come face to face with yourself. Getting to know yourself. Because if I ask you, and you could take a couple of minutes to talk to your own neighbor, who are you? Who are you? What do you know about yourself? You're going to come up with nouns and adjectives. I am X, I'm this, I'm that, I do this or that. What does that tell you about yourself? Do you have a immediate, without any medium, experience of your own self? Most people will not. Most people will live their entire lives out uh, holding on to names and titles and adjectives and pronouns and so on. On words, but no experience of themselves. Is there a self inside this body? What animates this body? That's the first question, which is how do I get to know myself? And that's at the core of uh, the, the mystic and meditative parts of the Hindu tradition. Um, all the yogis spent, uh, so this is the um, Adhyatmic, this is, uh, our cosmology is also driven by uh, the same, same question, which is, who am I? What am I? What is all this? The beginning of one of our scriptures begins with just this. Athata Brahma Jigyasa. And now, therefore, the search for the source of everything, the search for truth begins. And it is said that Prior to this questioning of the nature of the self, we are only two-legged animals. In, our, in the Hindu system, that is called a dvipad, dvipada pashu, which means a two-legged animal. Because animals don't ask this question, who am I? They don't need to. They have conscious experiences in the Hindu system. We believe everything has conscious experiences because all of this is consciousness which is precipitated into, into matter. So, so we, we believe that other animals also have conscious experiences, except they do not ask this question, who am I? So truly, you're born into the human world only when you begin to ask this question, who am I and what is all this? 
only then do you truly begin to use all the gifts available to you in this human birth. If you don't wake up to this question, then you haven't woken up to, uh, to the true gifts of your human birth. Even an animal can eat, sleep, mate, and repeat the whole process. Right? The animal does not ask, who am I and what am I here for? What is all this? But only a human can ask, and only in this birth can we answer, because we have the intellectual gifts available to us to answer this question, to understand firsthand what it means to be alive. I'm going to pause. Questions? Can you tell me about Yana Marga? Uh, yeah. About knowing yourself. Yeah. Path of knowledge. Path of knowledge. So the knowledge is the path of knowing yourself. All the cosmology, everything that you hear about the world outside, all the Mahavakyas are key, like main sentences in the Indian tradition. All of them pertain to either a knowledge of the world inside or a knowledge of create the created world outside, which also informs us about ourselves. Uh, questions, comments? Yes, sir. So, um, I'm curious, you said humans, obviously, with consciousness, we can um, ask these big questions about God and um, our future and stuff like that. So, what is the role of animals that don't have this kind of rare consciousness in Hindu religion? You know, do they have like, a role, or, you know, in Christianity, obviously, it's like, they're meant to be in direct dominion, but is, is it, we're supposed to live all peacefully in harmony, or are they like, you know, oh, obviously, I know the cow has some spiritual is there any other animals that have um, some greater importance in Sure. Uh, that's a great question. So, in the Hindu tradition, um, so there are several layers of questions that you've asked me. Uh, one is, what is the role of other animals? And the other is, what is the, um, uh, the what do they have to do in, in, in their own life, right? Uh, so, the first thing is, uh, in the Hindu tradition, in, our, in the Hindu worldview, all of this is God. Everything is God. There's nothing that isn't uh, God. So uh, our God is within and, our, and without both. Uh, God is not a potter who's created pottery and just walked away. Uh, God is himself transformed. He's not even milk that has, has con con become yogurt, which is the other analogy. This is, this is God at play. You and I are both non-different and are essentially God engaging with Ourselves. It's like these two fingers talk to each other. They are not different. They are engaged through the same self. And that self is God. So in that sense, other animals, other creatures are not different. Uh, in, as, as being in God, because evidently there's nothing else other than God. Um, what role do they have in their own lives? The Hindu system is, uh, is based on reincarnation. And... And it's an evolutionary process of reincarnation. So, so uh, based on your deeds, uh, you could call it karma. You could be born into, you know, a higher life form or a lower life form, and you progressively work your way into a human life form. And the human life form is the only way to get out of this cycle of birth and death. So it's called the cycle of birth, no, so of, of birth, death, old age, and disease. That's the cycle that everyone follows, but you have to keep doing it again and again as a creature in this form and in this form and this form. So you could be a, a crocodile, a crow, or a cockroach even. And, uh, and that's just your karma, you're just working through your sequence of karma. And then eventually you get a human birth, congratulations, but now you've got to do something with it. If you don't do, you could be born again as again a lower life form, or if you do, and if you've done well, you could come out of this cycle completely. Yes? Uh, just another question. I think, since you need to believe that God is part of everything, are, they like, are there many Hindus that are vegan or, or vegetarian because they don't want to eat like other animals because they would be considered eating part of God? Sure. Yeah. I'm vegetarian myself. I was born into a vegetarian family. And uh, Hindus are uh, not... Uh, are actually uh, bimodal. Many many Hindus actually eat non not non veg as in meat as well, but their their vegetarian mode is is still present. they you know they're happy to eat vegetarian. They're not as much vegan because uh, you know, Indians are in general lactose tolerant, 
So milk is a good source of, uh, of protein and calories and cows are weird for that reason. reason, reason. So, um, um, so yeah, uh, Hindus uh, are not as much vegan as vegetarian. And, um, and it's, it's for several reasons, ecological of course, but also uh, uh, the other creature is a living sentient being as well and you don't want to sort of, yeah, cause it any harm. There are some extreme ends of the Dharmic tradition you wouldn't call them Hindu, but they're part of the same sort of broad umbrella. Jains, who would not even have uh, have vegetables that involve cutting, killing the, the plant, like roots, because the plant is gone, right? It doesn't exist anymore. So fruits are okay because the, the tree is getting rid of the fruits and vegetables. So, so that's what uh, the thing is. So the concept of dominion is not uh, the thing. Uh, the, the role of a king is always uh, uh, to take care of everything that is born. Praja is the name for the population, the, the, sort of the subject. And Praja means everything that's born. Anything that's been born, animal, plant, tree, human, is part of the, the king's domain. And now they, their job is to protect and serve. It's not to lord over them, but to sort of make sure the circle of life is working. Um, with getting to know yourself with the different steps, how do you know once you've completed a step or if you're going the right way within a path? That's a great question. So how do you know you're headed the right way in the eight steps, right? Um, so they're, they're, they're like pyramid blocks, so they sit on top of the other. So you can't go to the, and a lot of the times people run into trouble is they try to climb up without having mastered the base. The base of personal and inter interpersonal disciplines, not dissimilar from the you know the ten commandments in that sense. Uh, it's a lot of stuff which is foundational. Uh, you know, no illicit sex, no overeating, no wasting your energy, uh, no stealing, no lying. Uh, good stuff, right? Who could argue with that? But a lot of people don't do that, and they try to do the other stuff. What happens is, uh, eventually, their practice fails them, and uh, and they end up having to repeat the whole process again. And so that becomes a challenge. It helps to have a guru, and that's what the guru's job, the guru's job is not to lord over and tell people what to do, it's to show the light. And, uh, and a lot of this light is intuitive experience. If you could read it in a book, you'd have read it already. But a lot of this is like riding a bike. You can read about riding a bike or swimming, but you, you can't learn to ride a bike or swim by, <clears throat> by reading a book. You gotta do it. So all of this is intuitive, but as long as someone's done it, they can tell you the intuition uh, by you watching them or by you just being in their presence and so on. So it helps to have a guru to do that, but uh, you get a lot of fake gurus who haven't got the, the foundational stuff. That's just, you know, just bad. You had a question. Somebody had a follow-up question on this side. I can't remember who. All right. So do you want to try meditation? A few words before we get into meditation. Um, meditation, uh, the object of, of the object of Hindu meditation and all dharmic meditation in general, is to get to a place of active relaxation. It's not affirmation. We're not taking a belief and repeating it to ourselves. We're not hypnotizing ourselves. It's also not a thought of any type. We're trying to get away from thoughts. Uh, it's also not relaxation. If you're going off to sleep, you should just go to sleep. It's okay. This is a very active part of. Uh, so it's, it's you have to be active and relaxed simultaneously. And uh, and it's like this when you see um, when you see an Olympic player who's about to you know they're about to shoot the gun and they're about to, to go off to whatever they're doing. Do you think they're fully stressed out? No, right? Do you think they're completely calm? No, they're in this state where they're, they're relaxed but ready. Because they, they better be relaxed, because if they're not relaxed, they're too tense, they might be wasting their energy holding a muscle tight. And they better be ready, because they're about to head out into whatever they need to do. So any sportsman, if you've some, seen someone at bat, you have to settle into yourself, right? So that's what you're doing, you're settling into yourself, finding your base, and then holding on to your awareness and being ready. Being ready for what? 
being ready for whatever you need to do. Um, attention spans are coming down. And I said this in the other class, my favorite stat is the following. <clears throat> and I'll get into meditation in a couple of minutes. This is my favorite high horse, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, ten year, seven years ago, the most valuable companies on the planet were oil companies, oil and gas companies, energy companies. They were digging oil from the ground and selling it. At the end of 2017, off the top ten, six companies were in the same business. What business was this? Technology. You think it's technology? All right, think again. <clears throat> Does Facebook sell any technology to you? Does Google actually sell any technology to you when they make money? Some. But really, when they make money, all these companies are making money by keeping you distracted and using your mind space to place ads. You're worth two to three hundred dollars per year to each of these companies. Four trillion dollars of market capitalization, six companies, and this is just the six. And they weren't that large seven years ago. But right now, Facebook, Google, Apple, they make money, 10 cents. This is how they make money, by keeping you distracted. So I have a, my favorite uh, factoid and a chart that I like to show is distraction is the new oil. And, it's, and boy is it profitable. It's three times more profitable to be a distraction company than an oil company. Of the oil companies that were top six about uh, seven years ago, the distraction companies are three times more, more valuable than the oil companies today. Think about it. That's how they're making money, by uh, keeping you distracted, hooked to their technology, having you check in, update, like, share, whatever, and, uh, and then using that to monetize it. So I'm essentially saying that technology is a distraction. Not all technology is distraction, and that's why I counter, these are outwardly technology companies, but technology companies, there's a ton of other technology companies, SAP, Salesforce, Microsoft, well, or, you know, yeah, Oracle, these are all technology companies as well. GE is a technology company. Goldman Sachs is a technology company. But they're not making money from keeping you distracted. Technology is not keeping us distracted, but technology has got extremely good at making us distracted. 20 years ago, if you, if you were trying to make something addictive, you'd have to run focus groups for years. How much salt should I put in these chips? How crispy, crunchy should these chips be? How much fat should they have? How much potato is good enough in this, right? Lots of focus group research so that you can't just have one chip. You gotta have more than one chip, right? But now, technologies are running, you know, there's algorithms running tests all the time to see how to keep you hooked and addicted to that technology. What color you're gonna to respond to, what kind of updates, what buzz, what you know? What haptic feedback? All of that is just ways to keep you hooked and coming back, keeping you distracted, so they can sell sell you more ads, show you more ads, so you buy more stuff to be unhappy. So holding on to your attention is important as a professional skill for you as it is for me, because my other day job is I run an AI company. We uh, we're, we're automating tasks involving reading documents. Anything that requires low attention spans, you could be certain that a computer will be doing it sooner than later. So, work it out. On the one hand, technology is working to lower our attention span. On the other hand, it's sweeping away jobs that require low attention span. Where does that leave us? Not too far. So the future of humanity relies on humans being able to reclaim their mind space. Because to be truly human is to live a full, fulfilling, creative and engaged life. And all of those adjectives require the ability to hold on to the attention. And that's why you should learn to meditate. What, 
what we're doing is we're talking to the inner body, and I'm going to talk you through that. We're reaching a state of active relaxation. We'll do it for about five to seven minutes, just to give you a flavor. And <clears throat> where we want to get to is we are relaxed and yet actively engaged with whatever we're doing. Be playful, listen to my instructions, and follow along. Try to go all the way. Understood? Just make sure you follow along. If you lose me, Listen to my instructions, you'll catch me. Now I think he's just relaxed. All right, sit up straight. You might want to come to the edge of your seat, otherwise you'll just locked away and that's not good. So just sit up straight. Any comfortable pose is fine, close your eyes. Sit in any comfortable posture. Sit with your back straight and the back, neck, and head in a straight line. Let the eyes sink into their sockets. Let the tongue sit into the mouth. Relax the expression on your face. Relax your shoulders. Relax your belly. Now imagining that you're in a roller coaster climbing up, climbing up, climbing up. And for the next, when I say go, till the time I tell you to stop, imagine you're free falling through space. Ready? Climbing up, climbing up, climbing up. You're almost there, climbing up. Go. Stop. If you experience the free fall, your body just felt a little light, bubbly, and you almost felt you needed to hold on to something to, to prevent yourself from falling. We'll do it one more time. Climbing up again on the roller coaster. Up. Up, 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 go! Stop! Climbing up, 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 go! Stop. Breathe in, up, in, 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 and let go. Now when you exhale, I'd like you to open your mouth and just, just sigh out in a really long and leisurely sigh. So breathe in, 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 in. Feel that sigh of relief wash through the entire body. Breathing in. Once more, breathing in. Relax, relax, relax. Blinking, open your eyes. Does the color feel any different from before to now? Color? How else do you feel? Did you feel the fall? You feel calm? Yeah. How about you? Too calm. Huh? So, this was a quick meditation, there's much longer meditation sitting you can do. But the objective is always the same. You want to get to a place of active relaxation. You want to hold on to the reins of your attention and let go of everything else. And through this feeling of calmness, through this feeling of deep engagement, we can now direct our attention to that which matters the most, which is our own relationship with ourselves. 
<clears throat> we are not this body. It will be apparent to you. Uh, it was apparent to me when my father died and I had to light a fire to his funeral fire. I did not burn my dad, I just cremated his body. So we are not our body, we are not our breath, we are not even our mind and our thoughts. Then what are we? We're something beyond words, but we are an experience, and that experience is driving our entirety of our experience. We need to get to the source of that experience. Who is the experiencer that engages into this world through these these arms, these legs, these eyes, the stomach, these ears. Who is it inside that walks this earth? <coughs> That's the question for the Jnana Mark, the way of knowledge. Next up, devotion or work? Which one do you want to go to next? Work? Mm -hmm. Alright. Work. Oh, you lost out. <laughs> she was just louder. <laughs> Alright, so let's talk about work. So the way of work is called... Four, four minutes until the... Uh, the break? Until oh, the, uh, until the Q&A. Yeah. Alright, cool. Alright, so the way of work is Karma Yoga. And the deep engagement with our work is the object of Karma Yoga. Karma means action. Karma is not a female dog that's out to get you. That's just English language karma. The, the Sanskrit karma is not out to get you. Karma is simply what you do. And the way the Hindu system works is, uh, this is a, uh, it's a fully complete universe. So everything you do, like, like Newton said, has an equal and opposite reaction. That's just the way physics works. So everything you do acts back on you. But karma yoga is not just about action and reaction, it's about how you engage with work. And the one phrase I'd give you is, yoga is skill at work, work. Yoga is karma, yoga karma sukhasana, that's the Sanskrit word. And what it means is, when you're engaged with your work in a skillful manner, when you are faced with a challenge that you are up to, then you're deeply satisfied and engaged by that. If there's some things that you work that you're bored of, it doesn't engage you. But it should be challenging enough that it pushes you, but not so challenging that it, 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 it discourages you. And so yoga is skill at work. And, and that's the path of karma yoga, which is doing everything, knowing that I am not the doer. I'm merely a conduit for the universe acting upon itself. And this conduit uh, must act with skill and engagement. And that's the way of uh, karma yoga. There's more, but we're, our time is up. So that's coming. Let me get to your questions now. Good? Tell me about two minutes bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga, all right. Let me talk about devotion. Okay. So bhakti yoga is the path of devotion. And the, the core part of devotion is surrender. The, the core part of, it's the same with all faiths, but surrendering in faith is a core part of devotional uh, work. And, and people, and I'll actually come to your question uh, right here. People uh, who, who believe in science think that devotion is ridiculous because you got to surrender. And what is this all-knowing, all-seeing, non-bearded deity that I'm surrendering to that which I cannot see, right? And that's usually the response that uh, people who so-called believe in science do. But the truth is this, um, everyone has to surrender. Everyone has to surrender because this universe is bigger and wider and older and, and longer than all of us individually. And so losers surrender at the end. That's what we're taught in this physical world. But when you begin your journey with surrender, you're no more a loser. Only losers surrender at the end. And everyone must surrender. You should know that. So why not begin the journey with surrender, knowing that I myself am must, like uh, which is the spirit, which is I am a channel for whatever God wishes me to engage in. Um, and Francis, make me a channel of your peace. Make me a channel of your peace, yes. And that's exactly the thing. I am merely a channel for God's peace. And knowing this, surrendering unto this higher power allows me to now act with more ferocity and more certainty than I would if I was about to surrender in the end. 
because everyone has to surrender. No one's come out of this alive. No one's won the battle against the universe. You just can't. You got to surrender and then let the universe flow through you. And that flowing through of the universe is what's known as enthusiasm, right? Is it not? The word enthusiasm itself literally means, quite literally, to be filled with God. And you can't be filled with God if you're filled with yourself. And you can't, uh, you can't empty yourself of yourself if you don't surrender. So begin with devotional surrender. Empty yourself of your so-called ego and then let God work through you in a way that's enthusiastic and fully engaging and filled with joy and satisfaction. And that's the path of Bhakti Yoga. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. We're, we're doing great on time. We're learning. <laughs> Surrendering. All right. <clears throat> Do I, do I, uh, uh, let's see, uh, science and Hinduism. So uh, Hinduism is actually, um, Hinduism has no problem with science. Vigyan and Gyan are, are completely uh, consistent parts. There's nothing that science can throw at Hinduism which is, is not acceptable. It's just, uh, truth is truth and whatever source of truth we can find, we will consume it. That's the, just the way it is. We're not here to fight truth, we're here to learn truth. And, and so in that sense, uh, science is great. All we ask is, we understand that there is truth beyond the measurable. In fact, most truth is non-measurable. And we ask that people of the scientific mind understand that there is non-measurable truth that we have access to, that we cannot deny. Beauty is non-measurable. Art, love, uh, grief, pain, all of these are non-measurable things. How is it that our experience is entirely non-measurable? And we deny it, right? And that so Hinduism is completely consistent with science. There's nothing in science which is a problem. Yeah, we talked about scientism, which is the belief that you can yeah. solve everything with science and the problems with that. So yeah. yeah, that's exactly the argument. Is yeah, the that's perfect. That exists that are not measurable. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, uh, where do moksha and the uh, sort of the understanding of other religions? Um, I so there's a very famous verse in Hinduism, but it ends with the following two words: Vasudhaiva Kutumbaka. The way Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma is, is uh, we'll, we look at ourselves as rivers streaming and inexorably going into the ocean. All rivers coming and finding their way. All rivers have to eventually get to the ocean. And we're interested in the ocean itself. So any river is good so long as it goes to the ocean. And so all paths are acceptable. And in that sense, that's the reason Hinduism is tolerant and very absorptive in, in the sense that we can absorb other uh, traditions quite easily because we don't have a problem with paths. As long as it works, we'll take it on. We don't have an issue. So that's just, so we're cool with that. Uh, with, can I put something there? Because Dilgamin brought up in my class that there are, however, some absolutes such as Ahimsa. So all paths lead to the ocean, but, uh, so he, but there were some problems with non-violence and exclusivism. Yeah. So exclusivism is again. Uh, exclusivism so, meaning my religion is right, yours is wrong. I'm, a, I'm exclusivist. Okay. Yeah, and that's what I mean by that. Uh, agree, agree. And, and so Hinduism's problem is that others are, and, but we're not. That's uh, the thing. Ours is very, very inclusive. But if others are exclusive, which is my path only, then it doesn't jive well with Hinduism because our thing is look. If it gets you to to God consciousness, then more power to your path as well, because it's the same thing to us, mm -hmm. right? And but there are paths that are exclusive that say it's my path and my path alone. Everybody else who's not on this path is you know going to X Y Z place. Well, that doesn't work for for our system. That's just uh, the way it is. Uh, do I follow all aspects of Hinduism? It's such an encyclopedic uh, tradition that I don't even know what the all aspects of Hinduism are. But the interesting part of our tradition is that it's it's, it's not, so I, this is my personal philosophy, there's a distinction between expressed religion and experienced religion or traditions. Hinduism is a, all Dharmic traditions are experience oriented, not expression oriented. So, so we, we are more interested in, in the experience itself. The expression can change. The experience uh, tends to be the same. And, and so you can't really follow us by the book because there's no a, one book. There's, all books have to be experienced. And so what you live is more important than, than what you read or what you decide to get the person uh, in our tradition. 
Okay, uh, caste system is that's the big one, right? So caste system, uh, the way the caste system is, the the traditional scriptural basis uh, for the caste system is what we call guna karma viva. Guna means uh, uh, property, karma means action, vibhag means division, uh, and uh, in the way uh, the Bhagavad Gita gets to it is it says there is a four varnas. Varnas are not castes as much. The word caste itself is not a Sanskrit word, it's actually a Portuguese word you know, for purity. Mm. Right? Uh, uh, huh? I don't know. Really? Casta. Casta is, is pure, chastity. Mm. So chastity is, is the word. Caste is not a Hindu word. Jati is. Jati means birth. Mm. So there's a conflation of birth and station and activity. And and so and this may not be in the books, but our, our understanding is most of this is more recent which is the last 200 years when the Europeans came into India, they wanted to know how this society is stratified because it seemed stratified and they eventually came down to saying, hey, you got these things that kind of look like layers and there's some scriptural basis for it. So here are your four layers. But they were not permanent layers. One, uh, the scriptural basis is Guna Karma Vibhag and, uh, and uh, Varna. But Varna, is, Varna literally means color. Not skin color, but color like red, green, blue. What color are you? And what is about who you are as an individual? Are you someone who likes to think you're a strategist? Are you someone who likes to go to war because it's your thing, you're aggressive? Are you someone who likes to engage other people? Are you someone who doesn't want to do other stuff, just wants to do their own thing? Right? And in, in the Indian tradition, they concluded that people generally are of four types. They may have more of one than the other. But there are four types of people, and those you could be any one of those, or two of those, or three of those, or any one at any given point of time. But there are four types of consciousness that you could have, and and that's varna, which is nothing to do with your birth. It's simply who you are. So if you're an aggressive person, then maybe you should go to war because that's what you like, right? Um, or or you know be a lawyer or something, or a politician, and that's just. Uh, if you're interpersonally good, then you should be a trader because you like people, you like engaging people, and that's what you like doing. So you should do that, which is consistent with your internal makeup. Uh, the other is jati, which is birth, and it's an old society in India. So what happened is, happens is like over here, right? If you look at incarceration rate and, and other stuff, you could see even the U.S. with only 400 years of being around is stratified, very clearly, right? And so an older society tends to stratify, and that's why. George H. W. Bush's son is also running for president and becomes president, and whose brother is a governor in another state because it's a family business, right? And that's how family businesses tend to be. So a lot of guild and and your birth became stratified into communities that did a certain type of work, right? And so there's a conflation of this. The caste system itself is confusing as heck, and as data, it's a very miscible moving layer. People moved up and down the system all the time. And it wasn't that, you know, these, this community was never ruling. You go back in history. A lot of communities have been rulers of their cities and states uh, in history. So it's not that it's fixed. But because the Europeans were trying to understand, they ended up sort of creating and crafting this sort of very fixed metaphor on top, which is what is, is taught to even us as a caste system, but that's not really how it's even practiced in, in India even now. That's why there's a lot of confusion. If you're following India lately, you'd know that uh, there are people trying to be notified in the lower caste than what they previously were notified as. And you'd ask why? That sounds ridiculous, right? You'd think that people were trying to climb up. It turns out there are um, there are uh, there state-sponsored benefits of being in a particular Thing, and you want to be in that list, not the other list, right? So is this confusing as heck? Because a, a moving, sort of seething sort of society is now being sort of frozen into four layers, but it's not quite the case. So it's more complex than than, than you would imagine it to be from books. Uh, untouchability is there. Untouchability is um, part of it is purity, ritual purity. Part of it is simply. Uh, people have their own temples and they didn't like other people to come in. And um, 
there's a very enhanced sense of purity because of the, like I said, the foundational disciplines of purity and cleanliness uh, very deep in the Indian tradition. So even as a child, and I wasn't ta taught this, I would not let someone touch my, my dinner plate with their unclean hands. If someone touched my food with their unclean hands, I would not eat. It's just, uh, it's just what you infer. That's just, it's a very enhanced focus on cleanliness. And, and so people tended to have their own customs and rituals and other people were not let in because they were in course unclean. But that's just societies. Yes. So a lot of the, the stratification of society is a social evil and I definitely don't condone it. Uh, but again, I'm just trying to explain, older societies tend to stratify as the US has already begun to stratify, which is why the 1% and the 99% thing is happening. And, and it's always good to have a revolution once in a while to sort of mix things up and, and release some creative energy out of that. Did I get everyone's question? So what I'm hearing from the caste system is there is a scriptural basis that explains how people perform jobs that they're suited for. Individually. Individually. Yes. And then on top of that, there is this idea that you were born into a family trade and this is how these castes came about. Mm -hmm. And now with the Western influence, which was focused on studying, stratified it into what a caste system is. Exactly. Because we in this class, we read the, the text from the Vedas where Purusa becomes the Brahmin, the Shastra. His arms and his legs. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we read that text. Uh, so we saw the but, scriptural basis, yeah, but, but it you seems like the legalistic it, part came exactly. from a more Western influence. Exactly. And then Gandhi tried to undo that mm -hmm. all the legal influences, but the cultural influences, I would say. Are exactly. Yeah. And when I went to India uh, two summers ago, I spoke with some folks that were saying that some parts of India were still very caste based. Sure. Uh, yeah. So that, that I think that so what you're describing now, it seems like the caste system has been abolished from legal stuff. Sure. But it's still in the mentality of some people. Yeah, so uh, the confusion that our, our British friends left for to us is still sort of reverberating through the society where a lot of the schisms and a lot of uh, things are just are working their way through the system. People are trying to understand what the heck. Can you explain to me when, when were the British in control? Of India? So the British came to India about 1770-ish. And they Before were, that there was no caste system no, no, stratification? So in, in there was stratification, but it wasn't the, the four-layer caste system. The Jati, there were lots of Jati. Jati is, Jati is the Born, yeah. birth, yeah. right? So, so lots of Jati. And they, they were up and down depending on which region you are in. So Patels might be kings here and, you know, something else there. It depended on the region because they might be in power one place or another. Okay. But the legal structure around it was... Yeah, yeah. and so naming people down into a stratified thing, the British census in the... So the British were there from 17, later 1700s to um, 1947. Mm -hmm. and, right. and, and the East India Company was running for the first 80 years. That's the, uh, that's the, that's the announcement. Thank you. Sure. All right, quick round of applause. Thank you very much. Let me grab this.